it's uh it's gonna be so cool you're gonna love it today what the lord has is gonna be in ecclesiastes chapter three and i didn't even ask if i have any announcements today so i'm gonna pretend that i have none so go ahead and turn in your bibles to ecclesiastes ecclesiastes chapter three i want to just get right into this one. Oh, so cool you know today well I, I won't get ahead of myself so you guys are getting there 40 years ago 1975 40 years ago yeah in the I was four years old so in the world of music two notes were played together in a certain way so that it struck terror in the hearts of the people who heard them. So here's what we're going to do. I want to strike terror in your hearts. So guys, lower the lights, please, in the house. I want these two notes to begin playing when you're ready to make it happen. Go ahead. Okay, let me tell you guys, I know a lot of you were really laughing, probably remembering when you saw that movie. I saw it when I was five. Yeah, I know, that was craziness. That was just what my family did. Terrified. Anytime I heard anything even close to the letter E in the musical notes and F, when you put them together, that's it. E, F, E, F, E, F, E, F, mm, 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 mm. Oh, man, I had nightmares for so, so long. But here's what brought me to remembering the movie Jaws. Believe it or not, you know, today is what they call Back to the Future Day, right? Today is Back to the Future Day. Apparently, Back to the Future 2 was they had gone forward to October. Today's 21st, right? October 21st of 2015. I don't know if you remember in the movie, but in the movie, you know what was showing in the movie theater? Jaws 19. Jaws 19. Just look at the movie and you will see at the movie theater, in the movie, Jaws 19. And I thought, come on, that's perfect. That's just perfect. Jaws 19, I got this thing about Jaws, so we're going to put them all together for today. What does this have to do with Ecclesiastes chapter 3? How does this have anything to do with Solomon? Well, actually, I think it works perfectly. See, here's the thing about E and F. You play one, and then you play the other, and that's when terror comes. You play one, and then you play the other, and you realize that all that has come as a result of it is your legs get bitten off. You play one, and then the other, and you realize that you're going to have bad dreams forever and ever and ever one follows the other and only bad stuff comes you know what solomon in ecclesiastes chapter three the first eight verses you know what i called them i called them efs i called every one of those verses efs they're 14 pairs of you start you end what do you hope comes? Well, no matter what you hope comes, bad comes. Bad stuff comes when that's where you leave it at in life. You want good? 
Uh, you can pair stuff up all you want, but it's always just going to end up like an E and an F put together. Here is Solomon, and you know him. The guy is trying everything he can to reach. What is it? He, he wants satisfaction. He wants like the deepest of satisfactions that a human being could possibly want. And basically what he wants to know is, what is the meaning here? Why are we even here? Okay, I'm going to try everything and see if it gives me my answer. Well, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, it's more of here's just what it is. You put two things together and here's just what it is. It's a shark attack. There's no satisfaction in getting attacked by jaws. You're just going to lose your legs. So this evening, Solomon is going to deal with these pairs, these EFs, and see if anything else can come. You're going to notice the uh, title of this evening's message is EZ, not EF. Now, where did that come? You'll just have to wait and see. We're going to go ahead and check out what Solomon is doing here. And now he's talking about all of these EF, 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 all the way down. And then see where he needs to go from there. He needs to go to EZ. And he needs to get away from EF. Let's pray. And then we're going to check out our text for this evening, okay? Lord, uh, thank you for another opportunity to, to gather together as your people and we got to sing to you praises, and we're thankful for that. God, we're thankful for the servants you bring up here to lead us in that. And Lord, now we just want to turn our attention to your word. It is our prayer, please, that you would just fill us afresh and uh, prepare our hearts for what you have here. Uh, Holy Spirit, that you would give us uh, wisdom as we read and as we hear. Lord, wisdom to um, apply. God, all for your glory. Lord, to follow after your will for our lives. Lord, we just look forward to seeing what you have for us this evening. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so verses 1 through 9 is what we're going to read first, where Solomon presents us with those 14 pairs of EFs. Okay, the opposites, the life experiences, you start one and then one comes after it. Sorry, but, Solomon says, in and of themselves, he can't get no satisfaction. That's all he's got is the EF pairs. Let's read. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Now let's look at verse 9 real quick. What gain has the worker from his toil? That's like a ho-hum. It's just an EF. It's just a shark attack. There's nothing here that I can get. Life is a bummer. Verses 1 through 9, in essence, that was my summary to myself. Life is just a bummer. It happens. It's a bummer. There's monotony. It's boring. Everybody goes through it. In chapter 1 from several weeks ago now in verse 9, here's what he said. Remember these words? He goes, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. Oh, come on, Solomon. It's true. How about his dad, David? Psalm chapter 90, he says pretty much the same thing. He goes, our lives 
are that same story that's been told again and again and again and again. That's my summary of Psalm chapter 90. Our lives are the same story that's been told again and again and again and again. What I think is so interesting, maybe you were this thinking you were going to be different. Every generation, every generation has its people and they insist that they are going to go outside of the box. I was, I was more or less that way. I'm going to be the exception to the rule. You know, I'm not going to be like everybody else. I'm not going to play inside the box. I don't like boundaries. So I'm going to erase them and walk right on out. I'm not going to be a robot like you. Go to school, get a degree, get a job, fall in love. Or wait a minute, go to school, fall in love, get married, get a degree, or some order like that. Get a desk job, get, 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 have kids, buy a house, get a couple of cars, blah, 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 retire, then die. I'm not going to be like that. Every generation's got its so-called rebels. I left that. Oh, I left it in the media booth. Oh, I brought this. It doesn't matter. You guys don't bring it out here. But I brought something that I had given out, that Missy and I gave out to every one of the people who came to our wedding. 21 years ago, here in Prescott, there were like 400 people, and we gave a copy. <laughs> I created basically a newspaper, a, a newspaper. It's just, it was just front and back, but I called it the New Ahuja Times, you know, because we were the New Ahuja, so the New Ahuja Times, and I wrote a few articles in it, and, you know, I just thought it was the coolest thing for people to read, and that would be like, you know, what is this couple going to do in the future? What, what are their plans, you know? And so I wrote a little article about our plans. I wrote a little article about how I proposed to her, you know, over an intercom of an airliner and, and a few other things like that. And in this article, it's just a couple, couple uh, sentences, but I remember saying in there that uh, Missy was going to be a teacher. She was studying to be a teacher. And I was going to become the next Bill Gates. Or I was going to become the next, you know, John D. Rockefeller. I was going to be, I think, just to be funny, I said I might become the next Queen of England or something like that. But the point I was making was I was going to be different. Like, you guys just watch. In a few years or something, you know how Bill Gates revolutionized computing by the Windows thing. He, he, like, changed or technology, in essence, for everybody, for history to come. And I thought, all right, a guy like that, man, that's outside of the box. He's got a name. He's going to not be the same. He's, he's, he's different. And I said I was going to be like that somehow, some way. Whatever I did, I would be different to the mass. Whatever I did, I would rock the world. Whatever I would do, rock human history. Here's the deal. So Solomon would have looked at me, and he would have said this. Yeah, right, Raj. Yeah, whatever. Whatever, man. You're going to be all different. Y yeah, okay, whatever. You're going to say that you're going to do something. You're going to make yourself rich and famous. Okay, whatever. But let me give you a hard dose of reality, son. Uh, let's say you are the next great one. This is Solomon talking to me. Let's say you are the next great one. Here, uh, here's what's going to happen. Your name will last for a little while. You'll die. You'll na your name will last a little while. And then you'll be forgotten just like everyone else. Any so-called monumental achievement of yours, nobody's going to remember. Nobody's going to care. If they're going to use what you've done, they're not going to care about you. There, your name means nothing. Solomon's basically saying, even your high and mighty rebellion, it's been done, and it's no biggie. Even guys like you who think they're going to be able to do it all, it's predictable. Look at history. 
who to who, who who do you remember? I mean, you really have to think hard to get some names going through when it comes to saying, um, boy, there was something important. There was somebody good. Solomon goes, it doesn't matter who you are. Everything's been done. There's always a beginning. There's always an end. There's always something first. There's always something that follows it. And you know what? The best it is is a shark attack. You're dead. You're done. It's, it's you know, it's a little bleak, I know. But, but remember, though, I said it was going to be EZ, not EF. So we'll get there. Nevertheless, verses 2 through 8, sort of uh, uh, umbrella activities in the world, in life. You're born, you die. You keep quiet, you pry. You know, you're happy, you cry. La, 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 you do this, you do that. And then you're done. And that's why verse 9 just follows with this question, this rhetorical one. You know, what, what gain has the worker from his toil? That's one that says, it's, it's supporting his conclusion. There's nothing here. What gain has a worker from his toil? No matter how well you plan things out and no matter how hard you work, what gain have you? You'll love, you'll hate, you'll keep, you'll lose, you'll live, you'll die. Solomon's just telling us that's the fact. Life is a zero-sum game. Life is a vicious cycle. <laughs> one one uh, scholar who writes very well. Interestingly enough, I read his commentary on this and listen to what he said. In these verses, Solomon is saying, there's a time for this and a time for that, a time for this and a time for that, and you can't do anything about it. That's this scholar's summary of these verses. You know, normally he'd be like, the Greek says and the Hebrew says, and he would tell you all this verb, uh, about the verbs and the nouns and whatnot. He just goes, Solomon says, there's a time for this and that, a time for this and that, and you can't do anything about it. So what humbles Solomon here, and all of us for that matter, is this. Even though he wants to control, you and I, we want to control. Let's face it. It is built into us. We don't like to have stuff dropped in our laps out of nowhere. You do not like to have people tell you what to do. That's just the truth. You like to be in control of your own destiny. We like to just be in control. Solomon says, I've tried and so has everybody else. And it doesn't matter. There's always a shark swimming below the surface. And he's always going to come up and he's going to take you down. And it doesn't matter what you do about it. And then, and then at your funeral, people are going to hang out for a little while and go home. You know, I could just stop there. Let's call it a night, huh? Be real happy and smiley. Oh, you should have heard the message Pastor Rod gave. I'm depressed. So he follows this up now with verses 10 through 14, because this is where I really wanted to get to. Right, we all we all know verses those verses that we just that we just read the birds. I mean, come on, they made a world famous song out of those lyrics, a song with the oldest lyrics in all of history. That's it, the birds, right? That's what they that's what they sing word for word right out of Ecclesiastes chapter three. And they make it sound real neat and real pretty. You want to sing along with them, but you realize what you're singing. You know what? You're not going to smile that much. You realize what you're singing? You're going to be like, what am I even singing these words for? I want to sing what Mike led us through, not like I'm going to get eaten up by jaws. That's what the birds are telling us. But comes verses 10 through 14. And you guys, this is where that letter F gets swapped with the letter Z. Check it out, verses 10 through 14. Let me read it. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. 
He has made everything beautiful. Wait, hold on. Let me stress the right thing. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. Why? This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Oh, now we're kind of getting why easy might be the word we're thinking of rather than EF, the letters that just signify death, that just signify life is a bummer. Solomon has reintroduced, remember how many times he's done that now? I kind of call it like a hinge, like a hinge kind of principle where he talks about first without God, it's jobs, right? Without, without God, you're just dead and there's no meaning. But with God, and if you remember the way he worded it, he said this, life under the sun is jobs. Life under the sun is void of any meaning. But life in the sun, that's where the meaning comes. It is living by God. We called it over the sun, if you want to call it that, but I like to say inside the sun instead, S-O-N. Then meaning comes. Last week we looked at chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, those were the, those were the verses that uh, Martin Luther said, essentially, were the summary of Solomon's entire book. This is the realization he came to after all his pondering, after all his considering, after all his riches and women and real estate and everything else. Verses 24 and 25 were basically his bottom line. Under the sun, no satisfaction. God's presence, that's where satisfaction comes. Step out from under the sun and place yourself into the sun, S-O-N. Jesus, of course, is what we understand that to mean. That's how you get purpose. That's where satisfaction comes. That's when the F supernaturally falls away. And the Z kind of supernaturally floats and replaces it. Because there is now in you power. There is now in you, beloved of God, strength. There is now in you ability beyond yourself. And this is the key between living a life outside of God and living it in God. You see, it's hard to live life. It is hard to live life. And if you have to do it in your own strength, you know what? You're going to fail, huh? We know that you are going to fail when you try to live this life and do things on your own. Things are hard, and that's putting it easy. <laughs> things are hard. But when Jesus has empowered you, when you have committed your life to God and to be led by him, to be led through him, to be led of him, to follow his will, then frankly, beloved, life is easy. You know when we complain and we say life is hard, we got to be careful. Because what we're doing is belittling our God. If you insist that your life is too hard, you need to be careful. Because your God and my God promise us that one, he will never leave nor forsake us. That two, he will always give us the strength and the grace that we need to live a fruitful and successful life. You know, uh, Christians that 
forget those principles. Generally speaking, there is, a, if I could just kind of hone it down, firstly, we know it's sinful. That attitude, that heart is sinful. But I think you can always kind of whittle it down to the sin of pride. Pride being this. God, I have an expectation. And I insist. I desire that my path be that. I desire my journey to be this. And what we do is we essentially, we're telling God what it is that we want. Of course, the Lord will not honor our demand. And then you know what? Life is hard. Life is tough because then you're living no differently than a person who doesn't have God. And then you just got the EFs following each other. You know, you got the EF and then the EF and the EF and you're going to get taken down by a shark. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful to behold, church, that God loves you and me so much that he gives us all that we need to live a life of fruit, to live a fruitful life, to live a life that is meaningful, that has such purpose. Despite your circumstances, that is the life you are living so long as you are yielded to him in this way. Notice what Solomon says. If I take myself out of the equation and I allow God to lead, God to rule, God to do only what God can do, then the EF turns into the EZ. And I have indeed found satisfaction in life. When you put Solomon's words together from this chapter, we're not going to go all the way through. We're going through verse 15 today and then you connect it onward, what you realize him, what you realize that he's telling us is that in truth, there is no vicious cycle to life. In truth, nothing is arbitrary. Nothing just starts and ends and then you're done. He is saying, indeed, there is purpose here. There is a will and a will that is being accomplished. Turns out, it's not yours. Turns out, it's not mine. It's the will of the one who placed us. It's the will of our creator. You have been created, and I, says Solomon, as we go on in his, in his text, we have been created by a creator. We have been designed by a designer. And when we adopt this heart, oh, when you just say, yes, like, thank you, God, because it's all about you and by you, for you, when you look at it that way, you will be ultimately satisfied in this life. Now, we know, Christian, when we understand it from that perspective, again, in Christ, we are to understand it in that perspective, we also know that God has very intentionally placed you where you are for such a time as this to accomplish great things for his kingdom. See, we know that. Solomon had to get there. We simply know that. Solomon knew eventually because he had lived a life for the Lord, but then what does he do? He goes and he blows it. Remember, he gets drunk all the time. He doesn't obey God. Things go downhill. And then he realizes, oh, man, wait a minute. Like, I had a responsibility, and I didn't follow my responsibility. Believers in Christ, you and I, we know our responsibility. We know that we have been empowered. We don't have to wait for anything. We don't have to see anything. The Bible says that you are empowered by the Spirit of God. The Bible says that Jesus knocked on your heart and came in and resides there, he and the Father. The Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. See, we know when that's who we are in God, 
we are, man, we are purposed. We got, we got some work to do. We have been empowered to do it. We got to do it. And we know that when we do it, only fruit will come of it. So Solomon had to discover it. You and I, Christian, we know it. I don't want to get too far off my notes here because I easily could. But the question would then come, and I'll leave you with this question of yourself. So considering that difference, the contrast, you got it, he had to get there. How's life looked? Has life still looked tragically like Solomon's? Who said, you know what, I'll test, I'll check it out, I'll get there, maybe I won't get there, I'll do it, maybe I won't do it. Or you simply realize you are a child of the living God. And you have such a, you're, you're so loved. You have such value to him that you make sure to live in that reality all the days of your life. This is a, this is a call of ours, believer. Anyway, so let's get back to Solomon, what he says here. He says, I discovered this secret. I discovered that it's all by God. When God's in control, things are good. Now, notice in verse 14, I want to I wanna draw your attention to what he says there in verse 14, right at the end. He says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it. Now, here's the part that I have underlined. So that people fear before him. So that means this is the concluding purpose. So he goes, God has designed us. God has empowered us. God has directed us. And then he goes, for this concluding reason, so that people fear before him. Who'd have thought? Most of us skip right past that. We miss the significance of saying so that. So that people fear before him. Now, fear doesn't mean, you know, you're like terrified, you know, like you're, you're my dog Norman at the vet's office or something, you know, where you're just terrified and you'd rather curl up behind Missy and just hide there forever. That's not fear. This fear right here is reverential awe. It's reverential. It means the deepest, most humble respect. It means understanding your place versus his place and going, oh, you understand that he's God and you're not. And then there is a necessary result. So see, if you and I say, dearly beloved, listen, if you say, I do fear God, right? If you say, I really am in awe of God, I am so in awe of God. I mean, this is God we're talking about. And he lives in us, little old us. He's created this whole universe, and he lives in little old us? Yeah, that's who he is. This is the result. Your relationship will draw, oh, so close. You would call it to a level of intimacy. Intimacy, intimacy, scripturally speaking, um, refers to a connection that is not to be broken. It is a connection that is one where nothing is allowed to cause any division or separation. To be intimate with means to be connected with at the deepest level. And so when we Fear God, which Solomon says is the ultimate purpose of all of it, it means God wants you, man. <laughs> he wants you. He loves you so much. He wants you. Solomon goes, the whole purpose to life is to be connected with God? Yeah. That's what he says. And then comes the next part of being intimate with the Lord. It means you will say something that Jesus once said, which was, 
not my will, but yours be done. This is a part of the reverential awe. It means I will be in total, complete, absolute, humble submission to you, God, because you're God, and I'm just your child. Don't you love that we get to call God Father? Abba. Do a word study on that. Abba, Father. So we get to call him that. Okay, so let me, let me repeat then what, we, what, what Solomon has just completed. Life just in and of itself is just jaws, EFs. It's just meaningless. But then you put God into the mix. But you got to understand who God is compared to you. He is everything. He is all things. You have to understand that he is all things. Nevertheless, he desires to have you as part of his allness. And our response is this. Get connected and be submissive. So, says Solomon, you do that, man, life is going to rock. If you don't do that, you're going to die empty. You know, a shark is going to pull you down. So, let's, verses 2 through 8, okay, I won't read them all again. But consider now verses 2 through 8, just a couple of those things. So, what Solomon says is, uh, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Right? There's a time for sadness. There's a time for happiness. There's a time for having something. There's a time for not having something. If you remember, you are connected, right? You're fearful. Then you will understand that every one of those, every one of those um, pairs has meaning contained within. Um, every one of them by design is coupled with the other. You see, beloved, every time you cry, here's, here's the truth. There's a purpose to your tears. And then the next day when you laugh, there's a purpose for your laughter. It's not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary that so often after crying comes our laughter. You know, we know, of course, death comes after life. But none of these then become arbitrary. They all become very purpose filled and that's why we can say things are easy because we are simply following a design or a purpose we are following a design and achieving a purpose it's it's not me i don't have to come up with the purpose the purpose has been given and i just get to kind of go through it and so long as i go through it in my god man sakes Things are good. The fruit has been produced. Things are good. Yeah, so it's easy and not EF. Yeah, things might get torn, beloved, but listen, things will get sewn back together. Morning will come for a night, but you know what? Joy comes in the morning, the Bible says. In, in all of life, in every one of your experiences, when you have a relationship with God, everything has purpose. Say it, let me continue. Your pain has purpose. Your pleasure and my pleasure has purpose. Tragedy has purpose. Triumph has purpose. He is fashioning me and he's fashioning you further and further along into the image of his son. See, we knew that. Solomon didn't know that. But that's what he does to you and me. You and I, we, we, um, we humbly submit to his will. And when something like tragedy comes, we can actually float through it with ease. Again, why? Because he's the, he's the power to. Because it is not I being called to go through this tragedy alone. It is my God taking me through it. I can, I got a sigh of relief. I can go sigh of relief. I can smile ear to ear. Because I know that he's got a purpose. His interests. His will. 
but he's still looking out for me. Actually, the way I have it written down is all of it is for my best interests and his glory. That makes sense. All of it is for my best interest, but his ultimate glory. So, Christian, that's how we are called to live this life, with that realization. What's the realization? Okay, life is satisfying. What's the realization? That life has purpose. Why? Because God is in control. Because it is all by God's design. When you live in that realization, you are satisfied in your circumstances. Question, of course, don't answer out loud or anything. Are you satisfied? in your present circumstances. Would you say, I'm mostly satisfied? I'm mostly satisfied. Or would we say something like, you know, a month ago, I'll tell you what, I would have jumped up and down and said, woo, life is satisfying. But right now, no. <laughs> I don't, we do that, don't we? Listen, beloved of God. Satisfaction simply is in the realm of God. It just is. It, 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 you know, we don't get to, the Rolling Stones, you know, when they sing they can't get no satisfaction, that's because they're not doing it in Jesus. They're doing it in the world. We got satisfaction and we get it always this is a part of the lifestyle that you and i have to live one of the things that i've been talking about on sunday mornings through second corinthians is essentially lifestyle that we are living in a day and age particularly christians where boy there's a separation in the church there are those who sort of use jesus for their own benefit and then there are those who say, Jesus, use me for your benefit. And what the Bible says is it is the latter group, the secondary group, that actually will affect this world for Jesus. And Paul is talking about how even though life is a bummer a lot of the time, he's going to make sure that he's in that second half, right? That's who he says he, we need to be. And he tells the Corinthian church, you guys need to do that. He goes, don't you listen to those guys who come up to the stage and tell, me, tell you that I'm a liar. Don't you listen to those guys who say that, you know, you got to give them money or you got to follow some rules. He goes, you guys yield your lives to Jesus and just do life for him. This is what our call is in this day and age. And the way it's going to happen to you and me is when we know that we know that we know that we simply are satisfied. And we don't say there is a measure. And we don't say there is a condition. And I am guilty of it myself. I can be there for, you know, sitting in a corner and just kind of moping a little bit because of something that happened. Praise God for my wife because she will be used of the Lord to say, don't you mope. Don't you sit there in that corner, boy. You pray. And I'll say, you're right, sweetheart. That's what I need to do. But God, is that what you need, though? Is that what life looks like? Beloved, this world needs the latter half, not the prior half. They need to see Jesus. Uh, Philippians 4, let me get this on the screen. Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13. Paul says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, how? Through him who strengthens me. He's, that's just another way of saying I'm always satisfied in Christ. Same thing. He goes, I know it. I just need to know that Jesus satisfies. He's better than a Snickers bar. Jesus satisfies. So if you're moping in a corner, you know what? We're just people. We're, we're weak, I know. I Like I said, I do mope in corners sometimes. Let's, let's 
let the Holy Spirit convict you. Let the Lord say, this is not satisfaction, son. This is not what I have designed you for, my daughter. I haven't, I haven't created you so that you can go sit in a corner and be depressed and not be used for my glory. Come on. You know, pray. Pray, pray and seek out to the Lord. If that's you, if you, if you have those kinds of issues, just go to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Why is this happening to me? Lord, I, I feel like I'm weak and I need strength. You know, it's a good thing to confess those weaknesses to the Lord. He will honor us for those things. Lord, I'm, I, I think I'm tempted by something and it's actually leading me astray. I'm so sorry. Would you give me the power to turn away from that? Oh, just to remember that I am satisfied in you alone. You know what? God honors those prayers. Paul said, I know. I know he works it all for my good and according to his purpose. That's Romans 8-ish. Love it. I love it. I actually put, thank you that I can relax in you. You know, there's a great sense of relaxation. It's such a relax. It's so relaxing because in essence, you guys, this is what the Lord is telling us. He's saying, because I am your power. I am your strength. I am your satisfaction. I've got it all taken care of so that those pairs are not arbitrary. They're not EFs. They're EZs because it's all by me. And then he says, he goes, verse 13, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. How crazy is that? That the Lord actually empowers us and has a purpose for us and says, but you know what I want you to do in life? I want you to enjoy it. I want you to have fun. Uh, you know, it's not hedonistic to say I'm living, you know, to, to have fun. It's hedonism when you say I'm living to have fun my way. It's, it's glorious when you're saying I will live to have fun God's way. He says, enjoy it. Just do it my way. I'll give you everything you need to, need to do. Here's a commentator. There's a book called A Life Well Lived. By the way, it's a good book on Ecclesiastes. If you're interested in the good commentary, it's called A Life Well Lived. Let me, uh, <laughs> I'm going to read you some of the feelings that the author jotted down when he gets like in awe because Jesus or God actually says, hey, have fun in me. He goes, everyone is going to die. As you read this book, the clock is ticking. A 24-hour virus is waiting on you. There, <laughs> there are germs on your teeth that will cause cavities. One day you'll have to have a root canal. All of those things are bad and they're coming. So today, well, everything is okay. Go get a double dip of Rocky Road ice cream or whatever flavor you prefer in a waffle cone even. Take some friends with you. Lick your ice cream slowly. <laughs> is that even possible? Lick your ice cream slowly and just enjoy being together. Call an old friend you haven't spoken to in six months and get caught up. Rent a movie you've wanted to see and curl up on the sofa with some hot popcorn. Enjoy today, trust God, and have fun. I like that advice. I'm down with that, okay? Call that my exhortation to you. You are called to curl up on the couch, watch TV, and eat some popcorn. Double butter flavor, okay? You got to do it, though, because God says so. Go to Matthew, don't go to Matthew 6, but think about Matthew 6. What does Jesus say? Hey, hey, are the birds worried about life? Not the guys who sing Ecclesiastes 3, the, the things that fly. Are the birds worried about life? They don't even think about life. But, but my Father in heaven feeds them and cares for them. He goes, how much more does he value you? So what good is it for you to worry about what's to come or what has been? Why don't you just think about right now? That's something Jesus, the point he was making. You know, we got these pairs. There's going to be a beginning and there's going to be an end. God doesn't want you and me thinking about either of those. 
He wants you to be where you are right now. He wants you to be satisfied right now. Don't you be satisfied when something happens. He wants you to be satisfied right now. He wants you to know and he wants me to know that he loves us so much, values us more than the birds, that he'll take care of our every single need. So trust him. Be satisfied. Live like it. And if you're not, go to him and ask him why not. And promise him you'll change and he will strengthen you to change. Somebody had uh, told me once, this was some years ago, I was encouraging him. It was, this was in a counseling, in a counseling session, and I was more or less telling him the same thing. Basically, I was saying, listen, dude, I understand that life is tough. You've got it really tough, but I want to challenge you to be satisfied. And he almost got mad, like, like he thought I was belittling him, as if I just didn't understand the depth of his pain and for me to say back oh man just be satisfied and life will be good because that's what he heard uh, he wanted to hit me you know what I mean <laughs> but he didn't and we were cool but um, what he did allow me to tell him he cooled down and he was and he was humble and I appreciated that is I read him those words from from the Lord from Jesus remember when he says oh ye of little faith he says, oh, ye of little faith. That's Jesus pointing out a difficult truth. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, God will still honor little faith. But God loves when we have great faith. He really does. It is honoring to your God when you really believe. And the way you demonstrate your great belief is by acting on it. Guys, that's why we have to live in the now. We can say we believe all we want. You can, you can complain that life is a bummer, but I still believe. But if all you're going to do is live in the bummer moment, then what? Anyway, so I was able to point that out to him, and he listened. And wow, he was yielded. He was very submissive. And I would say with it probably by the next session, which was a week later, boy, this guy was, it was, it was a transformation. He had already signed up to serve in the church. He was like, okay, Pastor Raj, whatever comes, I know that God's in control here. And he was satisfied. His faith was bubbling over. Like it made me believe more. It was just really cool to see. Beloved, that's a, that's a promise of the Lord to every single one of us. What do, you, what do you and I worry about so much? Why? Why do we let those things get us? Let it happen. Just let it happen. Next note that I wrote to myself, because now I'm reading you some of my own notes. I need to rest more. And I can rest when I'm satisfied. Does that make sense? No matter how much turmoil is going on, I can rest when I'm satisfied. Oh, here. We're sealed in the Holy Spirit. You think about those things? You ever just pray and thank the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, thank you for calling me your temple. How may I'm always so I'm overwhelmed by that truth. I am the temple of God. That doesn't even make sense. Does God know who I am? But he does. And yet he calls me his temple. Oh, how about uh, peace that passes all understanding? Don't we love that truth in the Bible? Hey, when we dwell on that, satisfaction comes. My encouragement to you, do what I did. Jot down notes of things that are oh so satisfying in God, okay? It'll make you smile every time you do it. Here I am. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, ring, ear to ear, you know, <laughs> peace that passes all understanding. Woo! And then I'm just keeping on going down my little list. I'm thinking, God, I'm so sorry that I complain. I'm so sorry that I'm just moping. I'm so sorry, Lord. And then he just makes me excited. Solomon's got that. You know, the Lord has spoken to this guy. The EF has turned into the EZ. It's all through God. 
you guys, when, when, um, when you realize this truth, let's say you were writing down these words, you know, about the peace that passes all understanding and whatnot. Here's what will happen. So you will experience this sense of satisfaction that is overwhelming because it is. Huh? Present tense. It just is. No conditions. It just is. What God does next. What does he do in his scriptures when his people act on their faith? What does he do when his people are satisfied in him and say, here I am, Lord, send me? He sends them. You go, you go story after story. You go through the, the apostles of the New Testament. You go through the prophets of the Old Testament. Every one of those guys will get to a place where they just said, okay, Lord, I'm throwing my hands up and I'm following whatever it is that you do. And God says, okay, good, that's what I was waiting for. And he sends them off, gives them opportunity. Door open. We've been talking about doors open on Sundays. Uh, uh, doors open. Uh, they step through. And I notice how many of these guys, their opportunities, you could call them adventures. You know, most of what they did wasn't bland. Most of the stories of conversions, most of the stories of being able to love people, minister to people, or even fight off enemies, it wasn't bland stuff. This was like, God, he gives us these epic tales. And I think he does that for a purpose. I think it's to, it's to spur us on. I think it's to encourage us. I don't think God put in really, really exciting uh, interactions between his people and others to fool us. You know what? When you go all out in a satisfied way, soldier of Christ, he's going to give you some epic battles to fight. And you're going to be satisfied. And there's going to be fruit. Something's going to come. And more than anything, please remember this. Your God will be glorified. Now, more than anything, that's what matters. I've been talking about how we're satisfied. How we speak. Yeah. But our God in heaven, he's the one who's glorified through it all. I will... Um, back up to verse 11 for a sec because there's something that the Lord pointed out. The, in, in verse 11, Solomon says, God has put eternity into man's heart. You see that part? God has put eternity into man's heart. Let me tell you what stuck out. I'll paraphrase C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis once said this, I know that I know that I was made for a different world than this. I know that I know that I was made for a different world than this. Verse 11, little scribbly commentary. Every human being has a Jesus-shaped hole. Every human being has a Jesus-shaped hole in their hearts. And the reason why that just so stuck out, God has put eternity into man's heart, is this, beloved, because you and I are given the privilege to fill the hole. See, everybody is given this desire for God. Everybody wants to know like Solomon wanted to know. Everybody wants to be satisfied. But what is the pe what are the people in the world trying to fill this Jesus-shaped heart with? Alcohol? Drugs? Sex, money, all of those things. That's what they're trying to do. But somehow, by his amazing grace, every one of you who calls yourself a Christian, he gave you Jesus. And then what he does is he says this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you Jesus shaped perfectly. Okay, this is the gospel message. And I'm going to give you that so that you can hand it to people. And they can take that. And they can drop it right there in their hearts, and they're going to see how it fits perfectly. Now go ahead. You see, this is what God tells us through Solomon as well. If we know to be satisfied, uh, if we know to be satisfied, we know that there are those who need to get satisfied. And we've got satisfaction in our hands. We got it. 
don't, uh, if we know that those people are there, we have an obligation not to just sit on our satisfaction and say, yeah, you know, bless me. All right, everything's good. No, actually what the Lord says is because I've given it to you and you know that everybody needs it, get going. So an exhortation, okay? You share in the gospel. How many people are you telling about Jesus? Because it turns out that this is known as the Great Commission. It turns out that this is being, uh, oh, commanded by Jesus himself. Go into all the world, right? Tell them about me, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, making disciples. Hey, that burden's ours. I want to encourage you in this. Generally speaking, most Christians, here's the truth. Most Christians share Jesus with three or fewer people a year. Most Christians share Jesus with people uh, three uh, share Jesus with people three times or less per year. I don't know if that statistic applies to you or not, but it shouldn't. What should apply to us, you know? I'm satisfied. Door swings open. I step through with my Jesus-shaped puzzle piece. What do you want to call it? And I say, here, who is it? The person at Safeway? Is it your friend on the phone? Is it whomever, co-worker? So I want to encourage you in that. Pray. Seek boldness. That's a good word to pray, boldness. Let's close out verse 15. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Now I'll read the New International Version. I actually like the way they translate it better. They say whatever is has already been, and what will be has been before. So he's saying, you know, one following the other, following the other. However, this part, and God will call the past to account in essence what solomon is saying is once you know the truth god's going to hold you accountable to the choices you make so all this stuff that we've now been talking about for the last about 50 minutes now we know that to be the truth and what god is telling us is this okay you know it you got the information you got all the data oh you've also got the holy spirit of god living in you You've got my power and strength. He goes, make choices because I'm watching your choices. Make choices because you will be held to account. Hopefully that doesn't scare anyone. Because this is not about being held to account where God is going to say, you are now damned to hell. No, in Jesus we are secure. What the Bible talks about in this case is going before the Bema seat of Christ where we will go before the Lord and we will answer for life. And in essence, it's about, look, let me just put it this way, racking up rewards, heavenly rewards. It's about, it's about, well, it's that. It's about gain and reward. And I was thinking about it like this. Every time you choose to sin or I choose to do it the wrong way, I'm actually telling Jesus, you know what? I don't want that reward. Go ahead and put it away. Every time. The Bible says here, Solomon says, you know the truth. You know it's all by God's power. God's going to hold you to account now. So, beloved, how great an exhortation to close this study. So we know that we know that we know we can be satisfied and there's purpose in life. Solomon's like, yeah, that's all I wanted to know. But we're supposed to do something with it. The question then before us in your prayers and in your devotions over the next few days, Lord, what do you have me to do? You know, I know a lot of you are in ministry. A lot of you are just doing an awesome job you're praying and you're really going to work. Keep it up. Lord, what other opportunities, what other doors? Always remember, too, to pray, God, 
um, closed doors if you no longer want me to go there. And I go there. That's an important prayer. Lord, pray. I pray for open doors and I pray for closed doors. And I pray for boldness to do it. And then God watches. He strengthens. He satisfies. And he watches as you go through and do what you're called to do. I'll close with uh, Philippians 4.8. I just, it really, I dug it. It was my Devo this morning. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We get it, huh? Because he's that God who deserves it from us. Let's pray.